Hello and welcome to this breakout session forming part of the 12th annual Analysis Mason Telecom Summit. My name is David McElroy and I work as part of Analysis Mason's online events team. Now you may have already watched some other sessions leading up to this one, however I just wanted to remind you of a few points that will help you to get the most out of this and all of our other summit presentations. Firstly, remember that all sessions are available on demand, meaning that you can access them at a time and an order and a date that suits you. We have a selection of keynote and breakout sessions for you to choose from, and you can access all of them via the event homepage. And once you've chosen your chosen session, you'll have the ability to connect with the presenters, access and download useful resources, and submit questions. If you do submit a question, the presenter or a member of our team will get back to you in the coming days directly by email. Once the session is ended, you'll be automatically redirected to the event homepage, where we would welcome you to choose another session. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Research Director Justin Vanderland. So Justin, I'll pass over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you, David. Oh, well, welcome to my talk on friend and foe, the impact of new technologies on operators management systems. And in this talk, I'm really going to look about the idea of technology creating some real challenges uh, for operators, but at the same time, maybe providing some of the key solutions and particularly for intelligent automation. Uh, for them to kind of uh, combat those those challenges. It's a kind of an analogy, I suppose, at the moment that uh, things have gotten so complicated uh, that operators, you know, with their you know, new fabric, shift to cloud and so on and so forth, um, that actually automation is becoming an essential element in terms of uh, managing their services, systems, uh, and uh, interactions with customers. And it's almost like a, a fly-by-wire airplane in comparison uh, to old-fashioned aeroplanes which used wires and, and cables to go and drive them. And at the same time, you know, those automations also need to have a certain degree of flexibility and be able to develop and change and morph very rapidly as changing requirements come down, no, not just from a technological perspective, but actually from a supply chain area as well. And again, as another sort of analogy, it's a bit like looking at fighter jets, you know, which inherently are sort of built to be unstable but are ready for very rapid change of movements or directions associated with that. And so it's a hard trick in terms of dealing with those things. So in terms of uh, the talk, I'm really breaking this into sort of three areas, uh, looking at some of the challenges and changes going on within systems at the moment and what's going on uh, in terms of how those have been sort of addressed with automation. I'm going to take a specific look at SaaS uh, and cloud-based platforms in terms of how those are supporting uh, the shift to uh, intelligent automation solutions, and then look at automation itself in providing, um, you know, what are the sort of the stepping stones and some of the thoughts associated with delivery of some of those automations in terms of the management systems themselves. So the first one, just going to look at the, the challenges. And of course, you know, network and services, as I said, are becoming really complicated to manage. And particularly with 5G, um, it's coming together. It's not that these things were all around 5G. They just seem to be uh, going through this sort of IT iteration kind of at the same time as the, as the 5G uh, uh, era comes in. They've all arrived roughly on the same time as we're going through a large sort of IT transformation, indeed network transformation and, uh, and uh, data center transformation. All of these technologies are kind of happening at, at, at the same moment. So as we're aware, you know, 4G to 5G is yet another G, but in fact it isn't. There's a level of complications over and above the leap which went from 3 to 4G. Uh, there's more frequencies to, to be con concerned with. There's obviously co coexistence with the 4G network anyway, and of course the ongoing support for even some of the 3G and 2G networks. At the same time, we're looking at a shift to cloud compute. Um, and all that's associated with that. So that's actually how you inherently support um, your workloads onto public cloud providers, the breakdown of those uh, applications um, into microservices. Those microservices um, uh, can be supplied by one vendor or multiple vendors in different locations uh, associated with that. Um, and of course, the delivery of those might be done from a, your own data center um, from a, uh, a hybrid data center, which has been spread to, uh, uh, to the edge, uh, and associated with a hybrid environment, which might be a, 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 a sort of a spreading of workloads into multiple areas, all of which are having a, a, a complication in terms of how you manage those. 
added to that, we've actually got the, uh, the new services which are going to be hopefully delivered through 5G. And those services are suddenly being aware um, of applications which, which they're supporting. So we're looking at many more new services which have got certain intent associated with those, which are helping support um, support that that drive of new 5G revenues, very much needed to support the um, the underlying cost structures associated with 5G. And of course, you know some of those services are actually utilizing cloud edge compute as well. So all these things are added to this complicated mix, and of course that is stretching and breaking current uh, management systems. Now, the one other area of complication which has been added in addition to those technologies is, of course, you know, OPEX was already set to increase in terms of the, the network OPEX over time. This is actually a forecast which we based some information on, well, bank forecast information from a year or so ago. Um, and, of course, you know, things have changed very rapidly in the interim. Now, OPEX is, of course, under increasing pressure and, and very acute and rapid pressure, which has been delivered through the changes going on within the European market um, as energy prices rise extremely heavily. Um, and that is, of course, a significant amount of revenue, uh, sorry, cost associated with energy, about 6 to 7% we've calculated. Uh, originally, of course, that has a uh, profound effect on operational, uh, operational costs. In addition to that, of course, inflation is dramatically rising. And from an OPEX perspective, that has an implication for, uh, for wages and overall costs associated with that. But at the same time of all this going on, there are actually a limited scope for operators to raise their revenues. Uh, consumers under considerable pressure, as we're all aware of. So we're ending up with this classic pincer movement of both delivering against the technological requirements, the service requirements, in an area where we're seeing rising operational costs which are outside of the telecom's control. Now, the good news is um, that essentially this can be partially addressed uh, through increased levels of automation. Now, automations have been around for some time, and these are the sort of areas that they address. Obviously, you know, we've got to be a little faster um, in terms of delivering stuff. That, that's what automations primarily help. Uh, they also lower costs, which, of course, are part of everything. We'll come on to that in a second. And, of course, increased efficiencies. They also add to the process as well in terms of being able to be more predictable, producing fewer errors. About uh, 70 or so percent of all errors are introduced through manual processes within operators. And we've certainly seen um, some of the more innovative uh, approaches to automation, primarily at driving out errors and stopping humans uh, actually getting involved with uh, uh, some of the operational uh, uh, configurations of networks. But of course, they also provide an ability to scale and have be, have be more flexible in terms of how you deliver vir virtualized services, et cetera, over time. So ultimately, does it end up with a better customer experience? Well, I suppose overall, from an, from a, uh, from a, from an automations perspective, we know these has been around for some time. It's hardly a new invention. Um, and certainly from a survey we carried out about a year or so ago, um, we see that about 50% of operators um, you know, have placed automation in their top three initiatives, and that's hardly a surprise. Um, and clearly, going back to my previous point, operation, operation OPEX reductions is absolutely the key driver in here for over 72% of those uh, CSPs. And of course, we know that um, operators are very much already implementing um, automation that have been for, for many, many years. But at the same time, just automating your old processes using your old systems and interfaces, and indeed using your established data sources, probably isn't going to get you where you need to get to from an intelligent or hyper-automation perspective. A system rationalization is kind of needed, uh, and the process rationalization associated with that needs to be considered as well. And of course, all this needs to be built on data sets, which are, um, you know, being viewed either as a single federated data uh, set, or indeed, maybe even from a data consolidation perspective, actually even brought together. So automations in its own right needs to have these under underlying activities in order to be really successful in what they're able to achieve. So let's dig a little deeper into SaaS um, and how SaaS-based platforms are supporting that drive to automation. So we know that SaaS is, you know, has some very generic benefits in terms of being able to provide 
um, you know, the initial uh, lower cost investment, uh, which uh, which enables for a, a low a low cost startup, uh, potentially a low cost overall in terms of the overall investment, depending on how it's been implemented, uh, and certainly predictable payments in terms of uh, the costs associated with that. So uh, nice and predictable in terms of the the, the outgoing opex uh, and capex uh, structures associated with it. More importantly, maybe it provides a, ta a faster time to market. Um, and this goes associated with the first point in terms of initial investment, but it means that you can actually go and sort of fail and trial and fail fast um, at relatively low cost. It means that innovation can be improved upon in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying new things out. And I think that's kind of important in terms of automation, as we'll get to that, um, in terms of being able to try different processes uh, through, uh, through the operator, uh, and if they don't fail, to, ch to change them and to try something different. Of course, you know, it's easier, potentially, uh, faster to implement, and it has that, uh, in terms of that scalability. Um, inherently, if you're delivering this on a cloud-based platform, that capacity can be built up and indeed can be reduced, depending on the demand for that particular service. And one of the, the tricks, which certainly from an automated process always uh, can, can cause issues, is that scaling a process at, uh, you know, an automated process at scale can cause all sorts of problems in terms of um, predictability in terms of where that's going to go to. So Saskia supports that, but it also, from a development perspective, kind of forces a certain rigor in terms of that uh, that development. Um, SAS-based uh, systems will have a, a requirement for data to be done in a certain format, which means that data has to be transformed. Um, it also provides uh, a steady set of um, APIs. So if you're trying to integrate that, and indeed we'll come on to this in a second, uh, also provides uh, access to uh, partners and the associated uh, technologies. We've already mentioned the fact that it's got some scalability associated, so you can scale it right, and enhance flexibility. And what I mean by that is ability to add extra functions easily uh, associated uh, with a particular activity. So it may well have built-in um, automation tools associated with it, or indeed some extra functions which can be brought in uh, or intelligence applied to them. So it, it provides a sort of a, a richer set of uh, platform capabilities associated with that. And indeed on that note, essentially SaaS is of course a platform play. And all those elements come into, 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 into focus, if you like, uh, as we move from a sort of a customization based approach to a far, far more vendor standardized approach. And that standardization and richness of interfaces, I think, is absolutely critical in terms of being able to build those automations in a stabilized way on, on top of it. So, of course, we can talk about functionality. Functionality and richness of functionality is by no means a, um, uh, a SaaS only environment, but certainly as those platforms and successful platforms grow, the functionality starts building out from them in a very much uh, 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 predictable way and also the ability for them to use those partners as part of that rich ecosystem of functionality which can be brought to bear on it. Now, um, SaaS-based delivery, of course, um, have their own development teams. They use Agile, CI, CD-based approaches, and DevOps, etc., etc. But also can expose uh, to the users of that technology uh, and, and platforms also uh, st standard uh, uh, development environments uh, associated with it. Indeed, of course, um, SaaS-based platforms, not from an applications perspective, but actually from a tooling, also provide capabilities within this space, particularly those provided by the public uh, cloud providers. Or we talk about the ecosystem and the ability to actually add functions in that space. And of course, the critical bit here in terms of integration, SaaS it sinks or swims essentially by its ability to work with other players. Uh, good, successful ecosystems are inherently uh, a critical part uh, for, um, for SaaS providers. So it is in their best interest to maintain a stable uh, set of APIs and make those open and as predictable and as stable as they possibly can on which to uh, to integrate to third parties. And of course, you know, the automations um, essentially uh, here enable for a far more flexible based approach. Again, uh, stripping out and maybe using some of the more, uh, the newer techniques associated with uh, taking um, the automations or processes somewhat independent of functions associated with those. And seeing the ability to add automations into SaaS-based platforms has been far more likely 
and some of the major players within the uh, the SaaS environments, so that's the sort of ServiceNows um, and indeed Salesforces, have inherently built automations and workflows associated with them. So kind of just a brief noting, uh, so it's just, just worth noting that uh, in Analysis Mason, we've been tracking SaaS for a year or two. Um, we actually do have SaaS trackers. And it's just worth noting, I suppose, that um, SaaS has gained uh, and continued to gain traction primarily within the customer facing functions. Um, but doesn't mean it's not happening elsewhere. We're certainly seeing some of the, uh, the element management systems, you know, covered by our network automations and orchestration uh, program, for example, is also uh, moving and shifting to SaaS. And, and indeed, in the recent uh, 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 digital transformation world, we saw announcements from various vendors um, as they both increased the function, functional uh, elements within their own SaaS uh, environments, or indeed launched whole new products within a SaaS-based SaaS uh, uh, SaaS tag. So just touching on really the automations at the back end of it and sort of uh, saying, look, these are going a little bit beyond human capabilities. Um, and, and in a sense that, um, you know, we're saying that it's almost a prerequisite now if you want to go and support, you know, some of these more complex services, um, that to have them not automated, i.e. manual, is not going to be a viable option in the future. The complexity has got too much and the scalability has become too great in order for humans to react in a timely and a cost-effective way. So automations essentially get applied in a number of different areas. Um, and we sort of see this as growing from uh, applications, which increasingly there are fewer of within the market space. Uh, as those applications sort of expand out, they provide uh, a good uh, domain specific areas uh, in which they can uh, apply their, uh, their, their deep knowledge and provide um, automations associated with that. The suite based approach enables for those applications to come together. So, for example, if you're looking at closed loop um, you know, within the assurance and orchestration space, uh, that we're seeing actually a, toast link, a close linkage between assurance moving from root cause analysis into being able to fix those issues and maybe digging into other systems, for example, inventory management systems. And having those from a, uh, a single vendor we see as being a distinct advantage. Um, and those application suites, or indeed applications, can be opened up within an ecosystem where, um, as we mentioned earlier on, those there are tight integrations which could be possible um, between the application suite and those associated partnerships, whether those are in a, a digital marketplace or within a, a tight uh, community which has been set up within a vendor. Um, it enables them to be um, uh, to be, have a rich richness in terms of integration. Of course, all these have to work in conjunction, not just with themselves in terms of the suites and applications, but with other applications. And we see that integration, particularly for business, end-to-end uh, -end business processes, is absolutely critical in terms of how they work and link, interlink with those. And of course, there are a number of techniques associated with this, whether that's just a simple data connection, whether it's using ML logic associated with that, or even indeed some simple rules or indeed third-party tools for things like uh, RPA or ro uh, robotic process automation to provide that sort of level of integration. And of course, at an enterprise level, there may well still be business process management engines working in terms of bringing all this together. So there are sort of different layers, if you like, within the mix um, of trying to provide the automations, uh, automation and automated flows. And so I suppose, um, one of the areas I, as I mentioned earlier on, in terms of um, being able to uh, support automations is critical in, in keeping um, those up to date and providing the ability to change over time. And this is just really sort of a note to say kind of what's happened here as we've moved from sort of in-vendor, um, um, you know, in-house work, if you like, uh, with a particular vendor, uh, moving through to more open platforms using APIs. It opens up those sort of possibilities or being able to take developers uh, actually skill sets and apply those to uh, using no code and uh, low code and no code solutions to enable business staff to actually do some of the work in sort of DevOps, uh, if you like, uh, based approaches, enables that sort of freeing up of, of resources to go and support changes to uh, operational requirements. And of course, you know, the actual development process itself is changing uh, from a sort of waterfall, agile, to a DevOps and AIOps based approaches, which enables some of the automation to be actually applied 
in the development process itself and used in a far more read readily usable way. And of course, data, which underpins everything, has moved from a sort of a dedicated set of data associated with a specific application. It went through a uh, big data consolidation using Hadoop and so on and so forth. And now we're sort of seeing it sort of come back out really in a more federated way and derived uh, data from that sort, of, uh, that sort of data set, standardizing it and maybe applying some derived data uh, and insights built from uh, from using AI and ML based technologies and maybe exposing that through standardized APIs. So it's actually far more consumable within the, uh, within the, within the data set. So one other area just to, to touch on and sort of finally, I suppose, is that in terms of automations, um, you know, if you're looking for an end to end business automation, we see this needs to work in conjunction with domain specific automation tools. And these might well be provided by uh, vendors, you know, specific uh, solution sets within each one of those domains, um, whether that's down at the network layer uh, in terms of infrastructure, um, or indeed at the services or the resource layers. Um, effectively, these all have to work together. Having a single orchestration tool which goes through multiple domains is 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 uh, certainly an aspiration for a number of operators, but it's extremely difficult to implement and have all the specific tool, uh, tool sets and uh, knowledge at each one of those layers. And what we're seeing is that uh, really these two things have to work in conjunction. You, you should have domain specific automations uh, and those are probably best provided by the vendors who are specifically uh, providing equipment, tools and solutions within the space and then really pass those up from a, from a sort of end-to-end -end business process into a separate orchestration tool. If you like the, um, the recent announcements with the TM Forum with their 921 um, uh, interface, which they've provided, provides this sort of intent-based layering, if you like. And so you allow for the automations to work within each one of those layers and you hand them off between them, but you have an ov overall orchestration tool which helps orchestrate, deliver that automation over the, over the overall process. So I suppose in, in, in summary for that is that you need to work at different layers with this and allow for the different, uh, different domains to be uh, automated through the knowledge and skills and indeed vendors in each one of those spaces while still maintaining the overall end-to-end -end business process. So I guess there's just a few recommendations at the end here. I suppose that CSPs, if they're looking at 5G and related services, I can, in order to make it work properly uh, and indeed actually even be able to uh, survive in the longer term, a high degree of, of automation is going to be needed to deliver those services and the associated infrastructure. We see data as being absolutely critical um, to the automation process. Um, and as we go beyond the sort of human capabilities um, is that that insight enables those, those deep and clear insights to be delivered against the um, against the infrastructure or indeed other processes you're trying to build. And, you know, we're a fan of a SaaS, so we're saying that vendors should offer SaaS services. We're seeing this bit has been particularly busy bit of the market. High growth rates in those SaaS, SaaS based delivery models should be encouraging operators uh, to, um, to, to take up that and vendors support them in that process. And I suppose finally, I suppose this, 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 uh, this friend or foe discussion in terms of uh, technology, um, you know, it's 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 a battle. It's but essentially the the uh, the technology is going to come at us, whatever we do, and we're going to have to use it uh, to improve the automations and uh, and help combat that complexity which it introduces. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you, Justin. That's great. Thank you very much for that informative presentation. And thank you to everyone who has attended. Before you go, I'll just remind you that you can still access and download some useful resources. You can still submit a question to Justin and either he or a member of our team will respond to you directly by email in the coming days. And I would just remind you that in a second, you'll be redirected automatically back to the event homepage where we would welcome you to join another session. So I hope you enjoy this presentation and we look forward to seeing you for another presentation very soon.